Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to be reading starting at verse number 18 and go through verse number 1 of chapter 4. <clears throat> I was impressed at how well we got the word out about no 8.30 service and no Sunday school because of the weather. I got to thinking I might have been a little premature on making that call when I made the call for us to do that inclement weather policy. And that is our inclement weather policy. We won't do 830 and we won't have Sunday school. We'll just have this service. I didn't see many people pull up at 930 for Sunday school. Chad was here about 730. Did anybody come for Sunday school at 930? Nobody? Now, what if we would have put out a word we needed to meet an hour earlier? <laughs> our message today <clears throat> really highlights what's going on in our country as far as the spiritual war that we are in in this nation. I can't emphasize that enough. We are in a spiritual war in this country today. And it all kind of revolves around family. It revolves around relationships. And the satanic, demonic forces that are at work, and let me emphasize, satanic, demonic forces are at work to try to tear down, destroy God's created order. If you would stand with me, I'm going to begin reading verse number 18. And again, I'll read through verse number 1 of chapter 4. And then we'll have our message. I'll pray after our reading. Colossians 3, verse 18. Now, after I read this first verse, I want, after I read verse 18, I want all you women to shout Amen. I'm teasing. You don't do. <laughs> and I'm going to define and clarify a lot of this for us here, okay? Okay, verse 18. Wives, be submissive to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and don't become bitter against them. Children. Okay, children, get ready to shout amen. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this is pleasing to the Lord. I heard some amens, okay. I think it was parents that said that, though. Uh, <clears throat> verse 21, fathers, do not exasperate your children so they won't become discouraged. I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard. Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched in order to please men, but work wholeheartedly, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it enthusiastically as something done for the Lord and not for men, knowing that you'll receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he's done. There's no favoritism. Masters, supply your slaves with what is right and fair, since you know that you too have a master in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we do pray that, um, and we look forward to the day that this whole earth will be filled with your praise. Father, we thank you for the time that you've chosen for us to live in, for this day, in the history of your creation. And we know that it's no accident that you've given us life and that you've given us life at this time for your purpose. Father, we pray that you would just, we pray that you would speak to our hearts, not these stuttering, stammering lips, but Father, your spirit to our spirit as we come to your word. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. 
Okay, the first kind of general point, <clears throat> and I would like to say, when we come to this, these verses have been used in various ways to, well, uh, in verse 22, talking about slaves and masters. These verses were used a lot 150, 200 years ago to justify slavery. What do you think about that? You think we need to go back to a slave system? If I could put it into a modern context, a current context, these verses for us today, we need to apply them in our life today. God's done a great work in this country in the last 150 or so years, recognizing the value of every human being, red, yellow, black, and white. Amen? What Paul is addressing here is he's addressing the Colossians. He's talking to them in the situation that they found themselves, the, the reality of where they were in their life. We want to thank God today that because of the Word of God and because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as Chad preached last Sunday, so powerfully about the impact, the influence of the gospel in every aspect of our life. When the gospel is talked about, for example, in Isaiah, one of the aspects, one of the characteristics, one of the outworkings of the gospel that captives would be set free, to set captives free. Amen? And we've seen that outworking. We've seen that working out in our lives, not only in the area of slavery, but also in the area of relationships in the family, husbands and wives. Again, Paul is addressing the Colossian church and the, and the social standing reality where they lived. But there's nowhere in here that we're instructed to maintain an immoral relationship by any means, by any standard. Quite the contrary, we're instructed to move in the, in the, for the aspect of liberty, freedom, self-worth, and determination. So I wanted to introduce this section that I've read through this morning with that comment. Okay, first of all, on family relationships. I've got two 316s to do, okay? Now we all know John 3.16. On family relationships of Romans 8, first of all, in Romans chapter 8, just want to highlight that we are a family. In the church of God, we're a family. Verses 16 and 17 of Romans chapter 8. Well, I really love verse 15. Our, our projector people love it when I go back and do verses earlier. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, verse 15, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, or if you will, kind of in our lingo, Dear Daddy. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children, and of children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, seeing that we may suffer with him, that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. I want to talk just a little bit about family relations from a biblical standpoint. Do you think God knows what a proper relationship inside a family should be? <laughs> I reckon so. Amen. And so I want to highlight some of the challenges, some of the reality of the fallen, the fallen reality that you and I live in <clears throat> apart from God. And it all begins back in Genesis 3.16. I've got two 3.16s I want to do. First one's in Genesis 3.16. Now when God created Adam and then formed Eve out of the, the rib of man, what do you think the relationship between Adam and Eve was as a husband and wife before the fall? I've thought a lot about that. It's kind of hard for us to wrap our mind around what that might have been like what their relationship was as a husband and a wife before the fall. How they treated each other. How they related to one another. I think we see something of the reality of that in Jesus Christ, what he taught us when he says this, the two, and that's also from Genesis, the two will become one flesh. Now when you 
Kind of get that in your mind. The two will become one. This is the way God does mathematics. If we add two and two together, we come, or one and one together, we come up with two. But God, when he adds one and one together, he comes up with one. The two become one. And that, from that standpoint, Paul does a lot of his writing to the church is about relationship with husband and wife. But the goal is that they would become totally, if you will, united. I think Adam and Eve would have been totally one together, totally united. Paul, talking about this in another place, says, husbands, if no man's going to hate part of his body, no, no normal person, why would you hate your wife? Why would you treat your wife in an ug ugly, hateful way? Because you're, in essence, you're doing that to yourself. But we see the fallenness of this here in Genesis 3.16. It's highlighted here in this verse where it says to the woman, this is after the fall, and this is a consequence of the fall. He says to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. All you ladies say amen. Any of you ladies had babies and it was kind of intense? I still say it's harder on the husband if he's in there. I will intensify your labor pains. You'll bear children in anguish. Now look at this though. This is the consequent of the fall. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will, Holman says, dominate you. I think King James says, rule over you. I want to, first of all, to the ladies, I want to kind of... Uh, clarify this thing about your desire will be for your husband because I've seen a lot of preachers try to say oh you know this means she will desire to be with her husband she'll desire to have let me tell you what that is nonsense that's nonsense that's not what the word of God says let me explain what what it means in the Hebrew that word desire the literal meaning of that word is to build a road over, or if you will, to cover. So if we were to put this in a proper interpretation, we would put it a paraphrase interpretation. We'd some, say it something like this, ladies. You will have a strong desire to cover, or if you will, to control your husband. You will have a strong desire to dominate, to rule over your husband. That is a part of the fallen nature of the woman. But now let me show you the fallen nature of the man. The fallen nature of the man is he's going to rule over you. So as a result of the fall, whatever the great thing that Adam and Eve had together, that they were one, they were united together, that was shattered in the fall. And the reality that we're all born with is we have this Conflict, built in conflict because of the fall, where the woman wants to dominate over the man, but the man, by golly, is going to dominate over the woman. It's right there in Genesis 3 Genesis 16. Y'all see that? And I want to tell you what, it shouldn't be that way in Christ. So we're talking about relationships here. Now then, Malachi, go to Malachi 3.16. This is the other 3.16 I wanted to touch on. Last verse of the Old Testament. Because our verses talked about fathers don't exasperate your children. I don't think I did a real good job in not exasperating my children. I tried to, tried to raise my kids like well, I tried to run my family like it was a Marine Corps boot camp. Amen, John. <laughs> Last verse of the Old Testament. Malachi 4.16. I'm sorry. Malachi 4.6. Last verse of the Old Testament. This highlights the spiritual war that we're in in our country also. He'll turn the hearts of the fathers to their children 
and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise I will come and strike the land with a curse. I'm, I'm sure you all are pretty well aware that Satan is doing all that he can to redefine, to destroy the biblical concept of family. A husband, a wife, children rightly re related to their parents, and especially the role of father with the children. Anybody re realize that... Um, we kind of have a lot of failure in the father role with children. I saw recently there was a news story here in Arkansas about um, kids being punished for inappropriate action in schools and how much there is. Now, the way the news story did it, it, they put it in a racial context that black kids were disproportionately punished more than white kids, which I don't doubt whatsoever. But here was the question I had. If we could take the race card out, the color card out of it, I wonder how many of those kids that are discipline problems in schools have an active participating father in their life that's teaching their, their children how to respond properly to authority. I wonder, I wonder what would happen if the news media would research that aspect of it. How many disciplined problem kids don't have an active spiritual dad guiding them, involved with them, and teaching them? I think the percentage would be sky high of how many would fit into that category. What do you think? I think so. So we have all this going on, this redefining of family. Um, Chad mentioned Right to Life Sunday. This is another aspect of it. It's just, it's almost bizarre how blatant this is. The Right to Life March of Friday, Half a million or so Washington, D.C. Did y'all see that in the news, reported in the news? No? Wasn't a front line, headline news story? Well, what happened yesterday in Washington, D.C. When, when it comes to marches? Did anybody see any news reports about this thing called the Women's March? Anybody see that? And they had the news story that in the capital, state capital of Arkansas, over in Little Rock, Arkansas, um, the Women's March was there, and they had their signs, Reproductive Rights. Did y'all notice the Reproductive Rights signs? You know what that means is? Um, we demand the right to have an abortion. That's what, quote, reproductive rights are. I've been following a news story <clears throat> on our radio program for the last uh, about eight months that comes out of the Women's March movement. It's, it's also an anti-Semitic movement, the founders of it. But really, that's kind of a minor point. A lot of people don't, a lot of people even involved in the Women's March movement don't realize that one of the goals of this movement is not just reproductive, quote, rights. <laughs> one of the goals is to decriminalize child trafficking I can't say child sex trafficking amen can you imagine a movement in America that one of its kind of subtle but not so subtle goals is to legalize the selling of children the story was broken by the Christian Post its website and the story was broken by one of the ladies that was in a leadership role in the movement. And she got uncomfortable with what she was hearing. And she tried to bring it up that it shouldn't be. And she got fired because of it. Uh, and I'll keep following that story. 
But here, we, here we've got the family, husband and wife. They should be one. They shouldn't be in conflict. One shouldn't be dominating over the other. Oh, and another part about this I wanted to highlight. I've heard a lot of preachers use this, for example, with battered and abused spouses, whether husband or wife. And normally, it's, typically, it's the wife that's battered and abused, or children. And so I've heard the preachers kind of put it this way. Well, if you just pray more, if you just get more spiritual, your husband would quit beating you. Y'all ever familiar with that? Now, I may be a little exaggerating, but I don't know that I'm a whole lot exaggerating. If you would just get more spiritual, your husband would treat you better. Amen, ladies? Yeah. I've heard that approach. And let me tell you, nowhere in the Word of God does the Word of God give either anybody, whether man or woman, husband, wife, doesn't give anybody the right to be abusive to another person. Quite the contrary. Especially in the family. Especially in relationship of a... I mean, you know, it says, you know... Uh, wives be submissive to your husbands when I, when I'm a, if I do marriage counseling I like to put it in a modern context like this you know be respectful just have respect then husbands you love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it I kind of have this feeling men if we would love our wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it she probably wouldn't have a real hard time having some kind of respect for that kind of a husband amen Okay, have I said enough about family relationships? Let's go on to the next one, vocational. Colossians 3.22. And on the whole slave thing and masters, I'm just going to deal with that as a vocational thing. We do have vocations. We have jobs and things like that. Verse number 22. Slaves, obey your human masters and everything. Don't work only while being watched in order to please men, but work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord and do it enthusiastically um, I remember the first job I had first paying job where I had a boss and got a paycheck and started paying taxes amen I was 14 years old I got a job there in Fort Smith with a, a Patterson's janitorial service started out and once a month, we would go into the Dick Gibson discount store in Fort Smith, kind of a forerunner of Walmart. Now, this is back in the 60s. And once a month, we'd go into that whole big old Gibson discount center, like a Walmart, and we'd clean the floors and mop and wax and all that kind of stuff. And I remember um, then, after the next year, when I was 15, I got to go to work at night with an evening route, four nights a week, where we would go, another fellow and I, and we had different offices. We'd go clean the offices at nighttime after the offices were closed and stuff like that. And the first night we were supposed to go out, um, of course, I didn't drive. The other fellow drove, and I rode in the panel van with him. We were supposed to leave, let's say, 5 o'clock. I don't remember the exact time. So I showed up at 5 o'clock. Mr. Patterson was not happy with Chuck because I showed up at five o'clock. And Mr. Patterson taught me one of the most important lessons of my life. He said, when, you, when we go to work at five o'clock, that means we leave at five o'clock. And for you, in order for you to be ready for us to leave at five o'clock, you have to be here 15 minutes before five o'clock to get ready to go to work at five o'clock. Somebody say amen. How many of you managers understand what I'm talking about? Amen? To do it enthusiastically. I think about this um, in church life. <laughs> Chad's got the slide up there about when needing workers. What do you think a church would be like if everybody in the church that had a, you know, a job or a ministry, teaching Sunday school, whatever it might be, what you, even if it was about coming to worship God, what if we really <laughs> were enthusiastic about what we got to do 
in service to our Lord. What do you think that would be like? Wouldn't that be fun, Chad, to kind of try to pastor a church filled with enthusiastic worshipers and enthusiastic servant leaders inside? The, that'd be fun, wouldn't it? Let's be that church, amen? To be enthusiastic. <laughs> um, if you are a manager... Um, how would you like for all your folks to show up for work um, kind of like Eeyore in that Eeyore the character cartoon character um, 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 um. and Paul writing the church of Colossians says and don't do it just when your master when your boss when your supervisor is watching why because we are doing it for the Lord you know, God ordained work. Did you know that? I mean, whenever he made Adam, what did he tell Adam to do? You're going to go out and tend and care for the garden. He made Adam to work, to work in the garden. And then he formed Eve and they were one together. So those are some of the relationship things. Then the last point, verse number 23, Colossians 3, 23. in our spiritual relationships. So we've looked at family relationships, we've looked at vocational relationships. Oh, wait a minute, one more thing on the vocational. Um, I saw, I didn't see all the interview on Dr. Phil. Did y'all see that the other day about this 15-year-old uh, girl, Nicolette, w wanted to be on Dr. Phil because her mother had reduced her, um, what do you call it when you get, a what? Allowance? <laughs> did did y'all see that? Her mother reduced her allowance from $4,000 a week to $1,000 a week. This, it was on Dr. Phil. And this 15-year-old girl was mad at her mom. And then badgered her mom. And the girl called Dr. Phil's people and said, we need to be on Dr. Phil. So her mother was giving her $60,000 a year. $60,000 a year as an, what do you call that, an allowance? An allowance? And the mom was going to reduce it to $1,000 from to 12000 from $60,000 a year. And Dr. Phil said, uh, don't you think maybe you ought to get a job? <laughs> a job? I think she actually started crying at the thought of actually having a job. Um, to, and she had to have a, like a quarter of a million dollar car. She wasn't going to drive some old Honda or Toyota around. She wasn't going to do that. Um, you know, for us, it's almost comical. But sometimes I kind of wonder about us from a spiritual standpoint. Do we kind of do that kind of thing spiritually? What we expect from God? Instead of what can we do serving God? Not that we're going to earn anything by any means. For sure. Okay, so that's the spiritual part. Okay, verse number 23. <clears throat> Whatever you do, do it enthusiastically as something done for the Lord and not for men, knowing you'll receive a reward of inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. You know, Nicodemus in chapter 3, he asked Jesus very... It's real pointed. It's kind of easy to overlook. He asks, he asks a proper question. He says, good master, what should I do to inherit eternal life? That's the right question because eternal life is an inheritance. It's not the result of earning something. You don't earn an inheritance. We receive an inheritance because of the family that we're in. That's an inheritance. So he got the question right, and that's why Jesus responded, you've got to be born again. You've got to be a part of the family in order to receive an inheritance. It's not something that you do. It's not something that you earn. It's not 
amount of work that you do, you're not going to impress God enough that he's going to say, oh, come on in, Chuck. You know, you really did really, really, really good in life. You know, you did a lot of good things. Did a, you did a lot of good services and stuff like that. Now, eternal life is inherited because of birthright, spiritual birthright. You must, Jesus said, be born again. Let's bow for prayer. Jennifer is going to come and prepare to lead us in this invitation time. We are, there is a great spiritual warfare going on in our country today. And a lot of the point of this warfare is in the area of relationships to redefine, to tear down God-ordained relationships, relationships inside the family, relationships in our working relationships. spiritual relationship with God himself. It's really, when you think about it, an exciting time. Father, we come before you this morning. We're humbled, Lord, again, that you've chosen for us to live this day, at this time. And you've told us, Lord, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of you, and you'll give it liberally, and you won't upbraid us, you won't condemn us, you won't criticize us. We need wisdom in this day. So much of the war that we are living in has to do with our understanding of your ordained order inside the family husband, wife, children with parents and there's so much going on to, to separate that to divide that to tear the, the biblical understanding apart and relationship inside your family the family of God Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that has not become that newborn child of God, has not walked into an inheritance that's eternal, we pray that you'd speak to their heart. We pray that you'd open the eyes of their understanding to realize it's, it's not a work, it's not doing enough good things receiving Christ to be born again to be forgiven to be redeemed to be washed in the blood of the lamb to be cleansed and to be transformed to be born again of the spirit to become a child of God in Jesus name we pray amen let's stand and Jennifer you lead us and whatever the Lord would have you do, you do that right now this morning.
Ja, wie ich 